Good morning, everyone. Thank you very much for participating in this uh, launched by the European Security within the framework of the LOUD project. Uh, my name is I'm here with Tatiana Morales, and we are both project managers at EFUS. Before giving the floor to our panelist, uh, Maria Lozano, I would like to take two minutes to present EFUS and the reason for developing a project on alternative narrative campaigns to prevent intolerance and extremist behaviors. Uh, for those who don't know what is the European Forum for Urban Security and what we do, EFUS is the only European network of local and regional authorities dedicated to urban security. It includes uh, nearly 250 local and regional authorities from uh, European countries. Uh, promote a balanced vision of uh, urban security combining prevention, sanction and social cohesion, support and inspiration um, for local elected officials and their teams in all major issues related to urban safety and security. So prevention of discriminatory violence, polarization and extremism are part of those of those issues. Um, and thanks to the proximity uh, we consider that the local and regional authorities are strategically placed to coordinate the implementation of preventive actions and to mobilize holders and citizens who can contribute to preventing those phenomena. Uh, so loud project that we call um, local young leaders for inclusion was born with the was born with the aim of fostering inclusive environments for young people in order to prevent them from drifting into intolerance and extremist behaviors. Um, our project Loud seeks to promote the participation of young people against discrimination and intolerance. And the project also promotes European exchange on alternative narratives among young people. Um, the basis to develop intercultural awareness and combat prejudice uh, to promote inclusion and social cohesion. At the beginning, uh, actually, local authorities uh, partners have conducted uh, in order to understand their local context, uh, the situation in terms of, uh, of the phenomena of discrimination or extremism. The result of this uh, needs assessment has allowed them to identify priorities and to select a group of youngsters and thanks to the project they are being trained in design development dissemination and evaluation of uh, alternative narrative campaign so they will be able to generate awareness positive reactions engagement and change of aptitudes towards discrimination based on ethnicity race uh, religion uh, physical condition gender and other um, well, the, the final output of the project uh, will be nine local alternative narrative campaigns developed by young people and um, promoted at the European level. Um, in this project, we have nine Europa, European local authorities uh, from uh, five different countries. We have the city of Dusseldorf and Augsburg in Germany, uh, the city of Leuven in Belgium, Hospitalet in Spain, Pella, Pella in Greece, uh, the city of Lille, pony and the Valenciennes Metropole uh, from France. Um, the project is also supported by three organizations, expert in the work of a youngster, the work with the youngsters and the development of campaigns. Uh, we have Eurocircle from France, uh, Mondinsieme from uh, Italy, and Street Work Violence from, uh, from Germany. Um, so thanks to this process uh, and uh, other projects developed by EFUS in the past, collected and adopted methodologies addressed to, to local authorities and local actors for the elaboration of alternative narrative campaigns and uh, uh, in how to involve young people in their realization. Um, and now we want to share with a wider audience these methodologies and these insights. It is for this reason, actually, that uh, we want to launch a series of webinars for, in total, um, 
So from, from now on, webinars are part of EPUS tools uh, to share knowledge and experience to a wider audience. In today's webinar, uh, the expert invited is uh, Maria Lozano from Radicalization Awareness Network. She will tell us about uh, how alternative narrative uh, has an important role in preventing discrimination, polarization, and radicalization at the local level, uh, why local communication approach is so necessary, what are the steps to keep uh, in mind when uh, building a campaign, our second webinar is planned for the 22nd April at 11 a.m., same hour, uh, at, the, at the, yes, 11 a.m., uh, also uh, led by Maria Lozano. And uh, this webinar will focus on how to design alternative narrative campaigns, how to create a message that offers a positive uh, alternative to discriminatory speeches. The third webinar will take place the 20th of May, uh, and the invited expert is Kelsey uh, Beyoncé Institute for Strategic Dialogue, ISD. And uh, uh, the webinar will focus on how to create an effective uh, campaign, how to reach the target audience, and how to spread the message. Uh, we have planned a final webinar on uh, June. The, the, the date uh, is still to be confirmed. But that webinar will focus on how to measure and evaluate an narrative campaign. Uh, so with these webinars, we would like to provide our audience that are mainly local actors uh, with knowledge in case uh, you would like to develop an alternative campaign as a tool to tackle discrimination, intolerance and extremism in your community. Um, important to know uh, that for our French speakers, a uh, retransmission of the webinar with the French subtitles will be uploaded uh, on EFU's website within 10 days. So this is uh, good news. Uh, before giving the floor to Maria, I would like to let you know that Maria's presentation will take uh, 30 minutes. You can submit your questions uh, by using the question options on the menu anytime. You can see the, the menu here in the slide. Um, and after the presentation, we will have 20 minutes to respond to those questions. You can also download the presentation from a handout section in the menu. You can see it also in the slide. And at the end of the webinar, a short survey will pop up. It will be really, really appreciated if you could fill it in with your feedback and help us uh, to, to improve. Um, now I would like to give the floor to Maria, but not before to mention her, mentioning her professional background. Maria has been a member of the Radicalization Awareness Network since its creation, and she is currently a member of its steering committee as a leader of the working group on remembrance of victims of terrorism, uh, also uh, since 2015. She has uh, worked as an advisor, lecturer, uh, expert, uh, and trainer of the United Nations Office on Drugs and Crime, UNODC. And she currently collaborates as a senior consultant with the United Nations in terrorism prevention and preventing uh, violent extremism. And this is just to mention some of her. Uh, now, without further delay, Maria, uh, the web is yours. Thank you very much, uh, Pilar, for the presentation. Uh, thank you very much for, for this invitation to deliver this so important webinar linked to the LOUD project. Um, and I say this, it's really important because as we will see along the, the webinar, along the presentation, the role of young people, the role of communities in delivering these alternative narratives is essential. So once at this, I would like to share with you which are the training goals that I have already identified. So hopefully at the end of this session, you will be able to answer to the following questions. Why the local communication approach is so necessary? What do successful alternative narrative campaigns look like? Which actors should be involved and what their role are? And as a local authority, 
that probably some of you, the ones who are listening to us, are already collaborating with local authorities, are representatives of some of them, or maybe are willing to start this sort of collaboration. So I think that this is one of the most important parts of this webinar. Why, which are the benefits of this sort of collaboration, of this involvement, and in which way we can, uh, we can start doing it. So, in the same way that uh, Pilar was stressing, highlighting at, at, the, at the beginning of this webinar, which is why it's so important the role of local authorities, why it's so important the, the role of uh, having a local approach. In terms of communication, it is essential. Effective communication is based on two main factors, as maybe some of you know. A deep understanding of the target audience by itself, I mean encompassing demographics as gender, age, and also interests of our audience as sports or music, but also a deep understanding of the communication environment. I mean, which are the views, which are the messages, which is the info and the emotions that our audience is getting, and uh, which are the views and messages that are surrounding our target audience. So, and this is important, any message will sound differently depending on these two factors. Now, if we add a new factor, which is internet, we realize that mainly communication and advertising has have completely evolved over time as internet has opened up the opportunities but the most crucial factor here is the local factor the local approach because this local factor will determine the characteristics of the target audience by itself as we as i said before and the communication environment of our target audience so Realizing, firstly, that we are speaking about political communication when we were addressing this term polarization, radicalization, discrimination. There's a political message behind we are speaking about political communication. So let's think for a moment about this political communication approach and let's think for a moment about probably the most successful political communication campaign ever. I'm now thinking about Barack Obama's campaign, okay? Even when it was mainly based or really based in internet, but it was locally organized, locally oriented and locally delivered, okay? And it was a success. In the same way and following this scheme, extremist narratives have a local approach as crucial when they are designing these campaigns, mainly because of two factors. The first of them is the exposure factor. I mean, young people is more propensed to buy these narratives when they are locally delivered, but also these extremist narratives have a local content. They are addressing local grievances, they are addressing local problems, they are using local voices, and also, this is important, they are trying to avoid local resilience. So, bearing in mind all these points, all these factors, the alternative narratives must also be based in the same scheme. They must have a local approach. They must have local content. They must address local vulnerabilities and count on local resilience factors. And of course, use local voices. So even when internet is a medium, it's never excluding this local approach. And following with this scheme, I think that the next step is saying, okay, if we need to have this very, very, very local approach, one size never ever fits all. So even if when we can be really inspired by successful campaigns, successful alternative narratives already delivered, I don't know, for example, in Germany, it doesn't mean that they will be successful, that they will be a success in Belgium or in Spain or in France. So please bear in mind that even when we can learn from other projects, we need to have this local approach and always be focused on the local needs and the local context. We have been speaking uh, during the presentation of the Loud project about different terms, different terms that sometimes can be kind of, uh, let's say, confusing, okay? 
it's important to analyze which is behind these terms in terms of extremist narratives, but also it's important to know which is the real relationship between them, between polarization, discrimination, and radicalization. Let's just start with the polarization term. Polarization can be seen as a thought construct based on assumptions of us and them identities. I would say us against them identities. In a process of polarization, the dominant and active narrative is about uh, the perceived differences about the others and always using simplistic narratives about the others, neglecting, and this is very important, what the us and them might have in common. So polarization shows itself in negative thoughts and attitudes towards other groups. As a result, polarization could become in growing hostility, segregation, and discrimination. So now, discrimination alongside with hate crimes, for example, growing intolerance, xenophobia, are manifestations of a polarized society. That's the relationship between those two terms. And now what happens with radicalization? Radicalization is a process thought which an individual comes to adopt extremist political, social, or religious ideas and aspirations, which is them, serve to reject diversity, tolerance, and freedom of choice, but also legitimize breaking the rules of law and using violence against communities or against individuals. So which is the real relationship between polarization and radicalization? Polarization does not necessarily lead to radicalization. And radicalization does not have to result in growing polarization. So maybe we need, can be kind of confusing. We need to realize that the answer lays in the factors that make people, that make young people vulnerable to extremist propaganda and recruitment. If you want to find further information related to this issue, this relationship, and related to these psychological factors, um, you can find it at the run site. And I think that EFUS has also some good papers related to this point. So being affected by a process of polarization amplifies many of the psychological and social factors that make people vulnerable. Therefore, a heavily divided community with hostilities between groups and a strong us and them thinking, us against them thinking, is the ideal breeding ground for recruiters and radicalizers exploring them feelings of fear, of distrust, distrust and rejecting um, the group of them. So once we have identified which is the relationship between these terms, how to counter these narratives, how to counter this relationship? From academia, from practitioners, they have launched four approaches that I wanted to share with you today. The first of them is the, to prepare. It's linked to the prevention phase. It's about critical media literacy of the population that should be increased, particularly by educating youth in schools, on, um, for example, how to evaluate and qualify the sources of information. But this should be seen not uh, only as an exclusive project, but as a part of a democracy training with the concept of critical thinking applied on a daily basis in daily life. The second approach is to disrupt, even when we need technology and big companies to support us on this, as uh, it's basically how extremist propaganda can be taken offline media by using technology. We know that these companies can detect and delay this content. And the third and the fourth uh, uh, approaches are linked to our project, to the loud project. The first of them is to empower. Alternative narratives which aim to promote positive messages, universal values, role models, and other kinds of information relevant for our audience. So here, with the alternative narratives, the goal is to strengthen the immune system of the society, to strengthen the resilience of the individuals and the communities. And the fourth approach, with the use of counter-narratives, Counter narratives that are aimed at exposing lies and flows of extremist narratives and organization. But, and this is very important, even when we will speak about this later, when we are using counter narratives, we need to be sure that we are targeting a previously well researched and narrow audience that have already showed curiosity or are in doubt 
related extremist content, because otherwise we could get uh, not desired results from our campaign. We will speak about the no harm principle, about um, w what can go wrong with a, with a communication campaign and with a, a counter narrative too. So, how to deliver these uh, communication campaigns, how to deliver these alternative narratives. Even when we will be focused on this during the uh, next webinar on 22nd of April, as uh, Pilar said, I would like to, to share with you very briefly, which is the model that from the Radicalization Awareness Network we are trying to spread with, with um, people like you, with individuals, with organizations that are willing to start collaborating with local authority, authorities, with government to start uh, delivering this sort of campaign. So this Gamma Plus model addresses all key elements that need to be taken into account when getting up setting up, sorry, an effective communication campaign. So the model, this model aims at uh, helping practitioners to increase the impact of their campaigns, but also, and link what I just said related to the counter narratives, addresses the do no harm principle. We will see that really well-intended campaigns sometimes and unfortunately have negative consequences. So this is the double goal of the Gamma Plus model to be aware of what what is working and what is not working. So very briefly, and just to to, to kind of frame um, uh, this model, uh, previously to design the campaign, we can answer some questions related to one, uh, each of the steps. For instance, related to the goal, we need to answer some questions like what do you really want to achieve, or what is uh, what are your objectives, and what is success for you or for your donors, or if you are collaborating already with a local authority, what is success for the local authority, and what is your theory of change? This is very important. We will speak about it later. Or related to the audience, what are the characteristics of your audience? Or what are they? The, what are they thinking? How do they behave? In which in which context they are uh, living or which is their language, for example. Related to the message, how do you ensure that your target audience responds to your message? We will speak about this during the next webinar. Related to the messenger, who are the credible voices? Who are the credible messengers? And related to media, what media does our target audience get its information from? or related to the action, how could online communication efforts help offline work, or what is needed for an effective call to action. So there are several questions that this um, Gamma Plus model will help you with you are delivering this sort of, uh, of campaigns. And now, just to, to go a little uh, deeper on how an alternative narrative campaign look like, I brought some examples. Uh, for example, effective communication campaigns always have an explicit, explicit sorry, theory of change on how their interventions aims to foster change. I'm sure that most of you are familiar with this methodology, with theory of change, not only applied to social projects, but also, and very important, to communication campaigns. So in case you are not familiar with the theory of change, I can invite you to look for some information, maybe with EFUS, maybe you can ask me and I can provide you with further docu documents and um, approaches related how to use the theory of change in your communication campaigns. Also, the goals. The goals must be always broken down into clear, realistic, and measurable objectives. We need to be realistic, but also we need to be able to measure our campaign, to measure if we have been uh, successful or, or not. Again, a deep understanding of our target audience. How can we get this deep understanding? And I think that uh, here there's a really strong link with the LOUD project. This deep understanding cannot um, be achieved by desk research and service only. That's impossible. You, we need, or local authorities need, members of this target audience in the team. In case this is not possible, we must partner with an organization that is already working with the target audience. And in case none of them are possible, maybe we need to change our target audience into 
a new one that we really know, that we really understand. Now, related the messages, they must be relevant or resonate with the needs of, of the target audience. Again, local grievances, local approach, and the messenger must be a credible voice, a local credible voice too. Now, the campaigns, uh, the successful campaigns, they work with the target audience preferred medium or online platform. The medium and the platform that they get the information related to our campaign from. I mean, not the medium that they use to speak with their family or their friends. We will speak about this later, about uh, when we address possible errors for these communication campaigns. And also, these successful campaigns always are aimed at changing minds and behaviors all of them need to offer opportunities for sustained dialogue, online and offline. Narrative campaigns that use the form of mono, monologue, sorry, will never meet the needs of the audience. An audience that wants to talk, or an audience that it's, maybe it's already upset, or it's, maybe it's already a rage about a real or even a perceived injustice, but monologues don't work. People don't want to be lectured. People want to interact. We can learn together with them, but we should never be lecture them. And then monitoring and evaluating, evaluating uh, evaluation tools since the very beginning, since the planning phase, uh, mainly to be able to adjust the activities and to adjust the campaign in case it's necessary, but again, and also to measure the impact of our campaign. Two additional points on how successful alternative narrative campaigns look like. Those campaigns that produce a constant stream of content for the target audience to interact with increase always their chances of having an impact. And in case your campaign is a great success, be ready for that. Not only in terms of interacting with media or interacting with uh, uh, your audience, but also in terms of um, risk management. Risk management related to your organization, but also risk management related to the credible voices that you are using in your to deliver your, your alternative campaign. Now, what can go wrong? Everything can go wrong. But I wanted to share with you some examples uh, about possible or even real campaigns that uh, went wrong. Uh, the first of them is those campaigns re reinforcing conspiracy theories. Uh, just for a moment, think about a campaign, say, for example, which, aim, uh, which was aimed at debunking conspiracy theories. Okay, and they produce a video, a two minutes video. So. Uh, the content they used humor, but uh, the twist into critical thinking was at the end of the video. So what happened? That the audience didn't get to see the end of the video. So at the end of the day, the message, the campaign was reinforcing conspiracy theories. So which is the lesson learned? Know how much time your target audience spends watching videos on average and make sure that your key message is being delivered within that time with it, that time frame, I mean. Other possible error, getting the wrong answers. Uh, for example, a campaign uh, addressing the audience in a very polarized society, and they were asking direct questions. Remember this very polarized society. What happened? That the audience didn't, uh, didn't like so direct questions, so they started giving socially desirable answers. Okay, so at the end of the day, it gave the impression that there was not a problem at all. So what's the lesson learned here? In very uh, polarized societies, ask indirect questions, examining which are your key interests from different angles, okay? And, and additional possible error, becoming invisible. Even if in a campaign, we are really focused and we want to deliver very coherent, uh, messages, coherent image, coherent brand. What happens is that sometimes the platforms, algorithms didn't recognize our content as newsworthy. So, which is the lesson learned here? Make sure that our products vary enough to be categorized as new by the platform. Last, uh, the last example, using the wrong medium. 
remember that the most important thing remember related to alternative campaigns and communication campaigns is getting the deepest knowledge possible of our target audience. Imagine that we are launching uh, an alternative narrative using Facebook, okay? And um, our target audience, of course, they use it, uh, Facebook, but they, they use it maybe to communicate, co communicate with her grandmother, for example. So our campaign would be a disaster. So which is the lesson learned? Understand where our target audience gets the information related to our campaign, related to the issue from. So not only the media that our audience is using every time, but the ones that they are using to get the information from. And now I think this is a, probably the most important part of the, of the webinar, of the presentation. Mm, we said before that it's important to involve members of the community in the team of the local authority, of the government, of the organization in charge of delivering this sort of campaigns, of communication campaigns, alternative narratives. Okay, But there are other benefits in addition of knowing the, the target. And the first of them is the credibility. Unfortunately, Sometimes prevention programs, communication campaigns led by local authorities do not achieve the desired, let's say, credibility amongst the audience. So if they start partnering, if they start collaborating with community-based organizations, with civil society organizations that already count on this credibility in the face of our audience, the credibility of the campaign will be increased too. The second benefit is the involvement of credible voices. We have already spoken about the importance of identifying the proper credible voices, the local voices. So, which is the role of communities, which is the role of civil society organizations here? To support us as a local authority or to support the biggest, uh, the bigger organization to identify which are the proper local credible voices, but not only supporting to identify them, but supporting these credible voices, these local messengers, meanwhile they are delivering these messages, I mean, uh, adapting the message in, in, in case it's necessary, according to the needs or according to the grievances of the audience, or even adapting the message in terms of how, where and when to say it. The third benefit, use of their own networks. Community-based organizations and civil society organizations, despite being not well-funded, I think this is common in, uh, around the, the European Union, but they are really successful with their own public, with their own audiences. They used to work in networks with other small or not so small civil society organizations, civil society, uh, community-based organizations, sorry. So there's a huge benefit for local authorities to start working with these organizations and using their own networks. So we will be opening up the door then to this collaboration with other organizations and with the community. The fourth benefit is the social capillarity. As I said before, these small organizations, these community-based organizations, um, are reaching uh, the, the real public, the real audience in needs of being, of being uh, supported. So why don't we use this already in use network so we can increase, we can reach out a wider number of individuals by involving these community-based organizations and civil society organizations to reach the final client, to reach the final audience. Knowledge of the target as fifth uh, benefit, I think that we have already spoken about it, but this is key in terms of communication. And as I said before, the ideal scenario would be to involve members of the community in the team that is already delivering or designing the campaign. But in case it's not possible, we need to involve civil society organizations in the team to identify local needs, local grievances, local voices, and local resilience factors. Don't forget about that. Now, the sixth benefit, risk management. Risk management and reputation management. 
And this is linked to the need to include evaluation and uh, monitoring tools since the very beginning, since the planning phase. Because by involving these community members and this civil society organization in our teams, we will be able to adapt our content, to adapt our campaign, to adapt even the structure of the program in case it's necessary. And this is the only way that we can get this knowledge, including members of the community in our teams. And last but not least, le legitimacy. The engagement of the community members in our teams, the engagement of civil society organizations, will increase the confidence and credibility of the target population. We have already spoken about it. But it will also show how the local authority has an open policy related to this field, related to polarization, related to discrimination, to radicalization, an open policy which is in full contact with these people and which is involved in solving the problem by involving in the solution the members of the community. And now, how to involve them? How can local authorities involve civil society organizations, members of the community when they are planning and where, when they are delivering this sort of uh, alternative narratives and communication campaigns? I wanted to share with you today a very brief scheme of what could be a collaboration model, okay? So, there are different steps that we will very briefly uh, address now, where we need to answer very easy questions as a local authority or also a government agency. The first of them is the needs assessment. As a prior step, we need to realize why do we need civil society organizations? What do we need of them? So maybe I answering some questions like, do I have the proper knowledge of the target audience? Or do I count with the proper credibility to reach my audience? Or do I have the specific structure necessary to implement my communication action? So depending on the needs, we will start identifying the proper community organizations, civil society organizations that can be the proper ones to support us when we are delivering this campaign. Possible questions to, to answer when we need to identify the, the civil society organizations. For example, has it a good enough structure or has it previously taken action in the community? Does it possess prestige and credibility? Does it have credible voices? Does it have local credible voices? Or does it have its own network of civil society organizations that could be useful for me as a local authority? Is it politically neutral? This is kind of sensitive too. So once we have identified our needs, once we have identified the organizations uh, that could support us when delivering these campaigns, we need to prioritize them, okay, according to the needs. And immediately, we can start with our action plan. What I'm sharing with you today, it's a model of collaboration. So now, related to the phases that you can see in the graphic, it's related to how we can or we should, depending on our needs, involve civil society organizations and community-based organizations in the different phases of the communication plan. For example, is it important to involve uh, civil society and communities during uh, the planning phase when we are establishing an agenda, when we are identifying objectives and priorities? Of course it is because we have already said that the communities and civil society organizations are the ones who have the real knowledge about our target audience, about the real needs of the community. In some places, in some uh, European countries, local authorities used to work with what is called a consensus table. In these meetings, they gather representatives from the communities, from civil society organizations, and from different agencies, from the local authorities, so they can identify together which will be the objectives and priorities. In the same way, when we are planning this communication campaign in the second phase, we need to involve them also when we are formulating and designing really the campaign by itself. But also when, when we are implementing our communication campaign, 
think for a moment uh, about uh, I don't know a communication campaign that that as a call uh, for action. Uh, it's uh, it requires or it needs of the support of a helpline or a hotline, a helpline that is already working within a civil society organization or a community-based organization that is working in our area. Okay, so that's a way of this, uh, first of all identifying the needs according um, to our objectives and according to the organizations that are already working on the field and in our local area too. In the same way as a last phase, phase of the communication plan, okay, monitoring and evaluating. We need, as I said before, the involvement of communities and civil societies to know if our campaign is working, if our campaign is reaching the proper target and in which way we should um, try to improve the delivery of this campaign. And now continuing with a, a model um, of collaboration, you can see that uh, I have included uh, the support to civil society organizations. This is crucial. As a local authority, as a governmental agency, we need to support these organizations that are already working. How? By funding them. We know that this is a terrible problem for, for most of our organizations, of civil society organizations in Europe, but also by providing them the proper training on the field. If we want really to improve our collaboration with civil society organizations and we want um, this collaboration to be sustainable in time and in terms of uh, quality, we need to train them. And finally, we need to evaluate this model of collaboration in which terms we have uh, obtained uh, the better possible of these uh, civil society organizations, of the communities. We need to evaluate if we have opened up the door enough to come with their knowledge and with their collaboration. So this will be a, a very, I want to think, easy model of collaboration. In any case, this was the, the, the last slide. I will be now really happy to answer any question and I really hope that I, uh, we could shed some light on how to involve communities when delivering these alternative narratives and how important it is to count on members of the community and with young leaders to deliver these sort of narratives. Thank you very much. Uh, great. Uh Thank you very much, Maria, for uh, the excellent presentation and for the interesting insights. Uh, I think that you have provided important, uh, important uh, elements uh, to our uh, local actors to act uh, uh, against uh, a toxic message and how important they have to, how important it is to uh, involve uh, local uh, organizations, local associations, and uh, also how important it is to empower uh, youngsters in promoting promoting positive uh, uh, message. Um, we have been receiving some uh, questions from, from our participants and we selected a few that we would like you to answer. Uh, for, mm -hmm. time, uh, for time reasons, probably some questions will not be answered, but uh, we'll provide uh, Maria's answer by mail to all participants. Uh, we have a, a, a question from one participant from US that he would like to know how to download the, uh, the PowerPoint. Just to uh, see in the menu, there are uh, handouts. You can uh, download the PowerPoint uh, here. Uh, okay, so the first question that I have for you, Maria, is, uh, is uh, what could be the consequence of uh, a communication campaign that uh, backfire? Okay, thank you very much, Pilar. Uh, I mean, uh, if something can go wrong, it really can go wrong. So, as I said before, for example, not reaching the audience because we don't have the proper knowledge of the audience. So, probably uh, spending a lot of money, a lot of efforts in a campaign that will never reach our desired audience. Also, the link to the no harm principle that I um, uh, mentioned before. Um, if we are, uh, for example, using not only alternative narratives but counter narratives, okay, uh, and we are targeting an audience that indeed it's not in needs of it. I mean, 
they have not shared any interest, they have no doubts related to any sort of extremist content, but we are sharing some content with them. The not desired result could be that we are generating and not existing interest in extremist narratives. So that's why it's so important to identify which are the real needs and which is the real um, uh, environment surrounding our, our local audience. And also um, being realistic about our, um, let's say, real knowledge about not only the audience, but about what we are spreading. Okay, so uh, in in addition of a technical, uh, let's say, um, Eros are not carrying the, the right uh, audience or even, as I said before, maybe launching a, a too long video so people don't get to the end and we don't get a, the proper message. I would say that in addition of wasting time, money and efforts, it's launching the wrong uh, message. It's linked to the no harm uh, principle that I, I mentioned before. Uh, thank you, Maria. And also re related to this question, um, uh, we have a question that how local authorities can counter the consequence of, of a bad campaign? Well, okay. Uh, ideally, when they are launching their campaigns, they should have included since the very, very, very beginning monitoring and evaluation tools and processes. So, Ideally, if they count with members of the community or civil society organizations or even um, representatives and members, officials from the local authorities, if they have included these monitoring tools, they will detect immediately that something is going wrong. So in this monitoring um, process, they will be able to adapt in time the content or to change the medium or to change the messenger. So, in case this is not possible because uh, maybe this is the first campaign and they have not included the, the proper monitoring tools, they can do it at the evaluation phase. So they can adapt the, the campaign and they can uh, work on a new one once they have realized which are the real challenges. Okay. In any case, of course, in case the, the results are terribly bad, they can remove the content from the internet, of course. Okay. Okay, thank you. Uh, we have uh, another um, question, and it's um, it's a long question actually. Uh, okay, so here are the question: Extremists uh, promote black or white answers to these problems, although we know that answers are very complex. But mm -hmm. the grievance uh, they underline are often true; they mm -hmm. exist. It's often mm -hmm. very difficult for local practitioners to deal with this uh, grievance. Uh, mm -hmm. They are not comfortable with them to talk about this grievance. Uh, mm -hmm. What are your advice to mobilize and support these local practitioners, considering that they are essential um, to raise awareness and support uh, and to support mobilization of uh, civil society? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Thank you very much. It's a really, really interesting question. Well, the point is that. Um, I guess that to involve members of the community in the elaboration of these campaigns, first of all, we need to uh, create a kind of um, trustful relationship meet between the local authorities and members of the community and civil society organizations. So sometimes uh, uh, to try to, to fight this lack of credibility, um kind of uh, raising awareness campaigns targeting the members and the officials of the local authorities so they can learn how to approach the members of the community and civil society organizations this raising campaign this raising awareness campaign so it used to be useful okay now, uh, instead, of course, and I completely uh, agree that um, they use these real grievances, uh, so they can they start working on that launching this them against us um, um, message. Okay, but once we have involved members of the community in our uh, in our, once we are 
already working with them. I think that this is the key step. Okay, we can start sharing this credibility among other members of the community and other members uh, of the network of these civil society organizations. So probably step by step, trying to create and to strengthen bonds with our partners, with the members of the community that are already working with us and rely on this credibility, credibility that these members of the community, they already have. Okay, I'm also speaking not only involving local authorities, but sometimes law enforcement, they have great relationships with some members of the community and it can be useful to involve them too. But always starting with this strong bond, strong partnership, strong relationship between the local authority and the members of the community. I hope uh, I answered the question. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Maria. And uh, another question that we have is concerning the target uh, audience and uh, mm -hmm. how we can evaluate a target uh, audience is ready to receive a counter narrative. As we know, these campaigns tend to be, uh, to be interpreted mostly as enemies narrative, which means it could be even uh, this is stabilizing for uh, local relays. Yeah, okay. I think that the knowledge again comes from the people working on the ground, okay? Members of the community that you have already involved in your team when designing and deciding if you want to use an alternative narrative or a, a counter narrative, okay? So, um, usually these counter narratives are a um, mass target, as I said before, narrow audiences. Okay, if we are speaking about a communication campaign, we are willing to have more success using alternative narratives. So, I don't know if I'm able, Pilar, to share with them a new slide. Is it possible? Uh, yes, of course. Okay. Yeah, you can do it now. Okay, thank you. So, please have a look at this, okay? So, here you can see that for a broader um, audience, it's advisable to use uh, alternative narratives, okay? Challenge, legitimacy of extremist messengers and messengers, okay? So when we are going up uh, in the pyramid, we start using counter narratives. Even when we are in process of de-radicalization, for example, it's when these counter narratives can be more useful. So for wider, audiences, alternative narratives in terms of prevention. I'm speaking about primary prevention, raising awareness campaigns, even secondary prevention. So counter narratives are really, really, let's say, um, sensitive, okay? So be careful with them, even when we are using humor, okay? But I would say that, that uh, this previous research must be done by, by in not only institutional researches, uh, but uh, research, sorry, but um, members of the community and civil society organizations working on the ground. They will provide us with a proper uh, assessment about if a counter narrative is necessary and it's advisable. Okay, thank you. And uh, another question that we have is um, which, which uh, social media is the best for, for, for a campaign? It depends on the target audience. I said before, I mean, but no, it's not the medium that your uh, audience is using for, uh, I don't know, sharing pictures or for speaking uh, with their crush or for speaking with their grandmother. Now, we need to identify which is the medium that they are using to get information related our campaign, related this issue, okay? Because that's something, this error, it's something that we have identified lots of times in Europe, in campaigns that were really well-intentioned, but they use the wrong media. So make your research. Uh, even I would say, why don't uh, we um, start uh, using um, other, let's say, uh, business tools? Uh, why don't we use a focus group? Why don't we start um, applying the tools and a kind of um, a pilot campaign with a small uh, group of our audience. In the same way that co as companies do it with uh, their products, why don't we start doing it? I would say and, yes. and, mm -hmm. 
And related to this question, uh, we have a, a, a participant who asked, uh, how do you select the target audience? Well, it depends in, on the previous research. I mean, which is the problem in the area? And which is the audience that you know the best? Even if we have a problem, it depends on the sort of organization that you are already working with. Imagine that we have, a, I don't know, a, um, a problem a, in, a, in a region with youngsters from, a, I don't know, from 15 to 18, okay? But our organization is more linked to, let's say, a, a gender approach, women, okay? And also mothers. Maybe our population, even if we know that the problem um, is uh, between males, uh, between 15 and 18, but our natural audience, because we are a civil society organization or a community-based organization already working with mothers and with women, maybe our target audience should be mothers and the message and the content of our campaigns should be, I don't know, I'm just speaking out loud, uh, thinking out loud, sorry, but maybe it should be linked to um, uh, uh, try to uh, provide them with a hotline or a helpline so they can get information in case they, as mothers, uh, realize that uh, their kids are in risk of being radicalized, for example. So it depends on your own experience. Don't try to experiment too much with audiences that you don't know, okay? So that's the key. I think that's why civil society organizations and communities are so crucial, relevant, important here because they know the, they have the knowledge about the target audience. But if we start working with a target audience different from the one that we used to work on a daily basis, it doesn't make much sense. Uh, thank you very much, Maria. Right now we are out of time. Uh, yes. Thank you again for your presentation and to respond to, to those questions. And also thank you all participants uh, for this uh, participate in this first uh, webinar. Um, we have been around 56 participants, which is great for us. Uh, we would like to remind you that our second webinar uh, is uh, scheduled for April 22nd and 11 a.m. And which continue, we can continue learning about how to design an alternative narrative campaign. Um, before closing uh, the session, we have a message pro, for our French audience. It concerns the Crime Prevention Awards 2020 launched by the French Forum for Urban Security. Uh, this prize aims to enhance the value of crime prevention actions carried out by urban security actors. And the topics of this year are improvement of relations, security forces and the population, construction of security policies uh, with citizens, co-construction, sorry, of security policies with citizens and prevention of discriminatory violence. Um, participation on this award is open only for uh, French applicants. Uh, um, uh, the applications are open until the 10th of April. All information about the prize is available in uh, the website of the, you can see the, the, the address here. And if you have any question, please contact our colleague, Paul de Boulder. Uh, he will be happy to answer to your questions. Thank you again, again uh, for your participation. I hope you have all uh, enjoyed and I hope you have all uh, have you all in the next uh, loud webinar. Uh, thank you so much. Thank you.